Funding for this program made possible by the Investor Protection Trust, the State of Alaska Division of Banking and Securities, and AARP Alaska. In today's program, we look at the Division of Banking and Securities and how to check out an investment advisor. Now here's your host, Ann Seacrest. Hello everyone and welcome to AARP Alaska. Joining us today is Christy Naylor, Securities and Enforcement Chief, and David Newman, Senior Examiner for the State of Alaska Division of Banking and Securities. Christy and David, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, first of all, Let's start with your background and tell us what brought you to your current positions. So after uh, college and law school, I worked for the state of Oregon as an administrative law judge for a period and as an attorney, and then moved up to Alaska to work with the division, uh, initially as an examiner, um, and then I became uh, the, the head of securities and enforcement um, in 2014. Very good. David. Uh, so I'm originally from Chicago, and I moved back there and did uh, private practice uh, for a little bit, and then decided we want to move to Alaska. So here I've uh, worked in private practice as an attorney. I've also worked for uh, a nonprofit organization, and I've worked for the state for nine years, the last four being with banking and securities. Very good. So tell our viewers what the Division of Banking and Security, what did they do? Well, we regulate 12 different programs, um, pretty much anything that's financial related except for insurance. Uh, we cover mortgage lending, um, we cover money service businesses, payday lenders, banks, securities, credit unions, trust companies, um, and others. And we have a slide up that in shows the mission of the division. Yes, our mission is to protect and educate consumers of financial services and to promote safe and sound financial systems. And we also have a nice photo of your boss. That's, That's right. right. That's Kevin, uh, Kevin Anselm, our director. Now, during the last legislative session, the division sought to update Alaska's security statutes. Why is this important? Our security statutes have been in place pretty much as they are today since 1959 when Alaska became a state. So they need some refreshing and we need to enhance some consumer protection provisions um, certainly. So we look forward to continue like, working with the legislature and making continued updates to the Securities Act. When we were rehearsing, when we were preparing for this mm -hmm. program, I have to admit I learned in a short order um, quite a bit about fraud. So let's talk about how Alaskans can protect themselves from fraud. And we have a list here um, to kind of watch what people can watch out as far as alternative investments. And if you want to start us off. Here. Sure. Uh, I think one of the things that people should watch out for, um, there's a lot of REIT offerings out there. Now REITs um, stand for Real Estate Investment Trust. It's kind of a private placement type offering. And what that means basically is that it's just not available on like uh, a public stock exchange to trade. And so what happens is these type of offers are presented to people as great deals. They think that they could get great returns on these type of investments. Uh, because these days, people are looking to get a high interest rate for some of their money. Like back in the day, 30 years ago, you could get 12% on a treasury bond and that would be great. But these days, if you go to a bank, if you, you know, uh, invest in a CD, which is a certificate of deposit, you're getting maybe one, one and a half percent on your money. So people are searching around these days to get higher yield. And, um, and these private placement type offerings sell that to people, whether they can get higher returns on their money. Uh, now, some examples that we spoke about earlier of these REITs. Uh, really surprised me. What type of alternative investments are included? Some very common... Right, so real estate investment trusts, REITs, uh, all cover different types of real estate. And usually it allows investors to invest in a pool of different real estate types. So it can be anything from shopping malls, 
um, to you know tract housing mm -hmm. to retirement centers um, and and lots of different types of, of real estate investments and you know people try to diversify their their investments by investing in real estate and that's certainly an avenue um, but you know these non-traded REITs they're allowed by law to charge up to 17 percent interest which means that if you invest a hundred thousand dollars you start off off at $83,000. So you have to gain 17% before you even um, begin to earn money on your investment. So that's that's just something that, that you want to look out for. And you know, with any of these alternative investments that we kind of list here, um, these are things that, that aren't the typical kind of thing that you'd be investing in. The typical kind of thing that a, that a, a normal investor is used to is stocks bonds, right. um, those types of things, mm -hmm. those are very highly regulated. And so while there's risk in investing in those types of investments, um, the risk is, is mitigated by the fact that the government and certain agencies like ours are really involved and, and kind of uh, ensure that there's consumer protection in those. However, um, for these more alternative investments, there's not as great of protections, and so we do see that there is some fraud risk associated with them. And let's say, um, I don't know, somebody invested in, got into a, this REIT, or a, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I'm gonna buy into a shopping mall or a, a assisted living, uh, where do they go to sell it? Well, so there's two, two important things to, to know when you're talking about REITs. And, and Christy mentioned one. Um, see, these things are sold because they say, oh, you're going to have an income coming in. Like, it's going to give you $500 a month, every month, and that would be great because people want the income to come in. But the problem, like Christy mentioned, is that you don't realize that once you give 17% up front, you're, it's going to take you that much longer to, just to get back to your original 100000 um, so that's mm -hmm. a big problem. The second big problem with REITs is that they're hard to get rid of, which means they're not easy. Like if you're selling a stock on a normal exchange, right. there's a buyer on the other side, you just place a trade in and they can get it. Right. Unfortunately, on, on REITs, it's different. You have to find a buyer on those. And sometimes these REIT companies, they have a system where they'll actually buy back these things. But a lot of times, the money that you're going to get is a lot less than what you paid for it. Pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. So those are two things as far as where REIT goes in these private placements that you need to look into. The promise of monthly re good returns, but the loss of so much interest up front, um, the loss of such a big payment up front, and um, the fact that they're hard to get rid of at the end. Now I want to clarify, are these, does the Division of Banking and Securities oversee this type of investment? We do. They have to okay. be registered with our office in order to be sold to uh, to Alaskans. So if you are approached about this type of investment or you're interested in a, an investment, if you have received a prospectus or something like that, um, you're very welcome to call us. We're encouraged, in fact, to mm -hmm. call our office and just make sure that they are registered with us. The other uh, item on the item under this list here is virtual currency or exotic currency. What are some of the cautious notes you want to add to that? So uh, people may be familiar with um, trading currency on what's known as a forex market, foreign exchange market, and it's usually a typical currency that people are very familiar with, British pounds, the euro, uh, the US dollar, things like that. Um, we have seen an increase in investments being marketed to people that involve more exotic currencies that aren't listed on those exchanges, such as an Iraqi dinar, that's a very common one, or Afghanistan, Afghani. Mm -hmm. And those types of, of, of currencies, um, they, they are sold with the pitch that um, because there are changes going on in those countries, there's going to be a revaluation in the currency. And so if you buy a lot of it now, then it will be worth a lot more in the future. Uh, the FBI has listed, or has issued some uh, warnings about these types of um, sales pitches and that some of them are in fact scams. And you just want to make sure, again, to do your homework. Um, Any time where there's not a readily available market, anytime where things are kind of new and exciting, um, 
such as Bitcoin, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned virtual currency, there's always a chance that fraudsters might try to take advantage of people. Now, the hot topic here in Alaska is marijuana. Mm -hmm. So let's discuss what could be going on as far as investing in this industry. What have you been seeing? Well, it's, I think, Marijuana can be related to Bitcoin because it's especially uh, in Alaska, these are new industries coming forward and a lot of people want to get into them at the ground level. And the problem with Bitcoin that's a new thing and, and people are seeing people that are making a lot of money or marijuana coming in and people are thinking, oh, there's a lot of money to be made. The problem is at the same time that's happening, that's when the scammers start coming out of the woodwork because that's when they know that people are going to be the most interested and that's the time they know they can jump out, you know, put themselves out there and get investors that they normally wouldn't get. Mm -hmm. So people have to be very aware when new things are coming, you know, new things are coming that stuff like Bitcoin or stuff like marijuana even in those situations, they're really going to have to do extra due diligence on those type of things. Right, and we're certainly not saying that people should not invest in, in marijuana type right. businesses. Uh, there are uh, certainly investment opportunities that are legitimate. We are just asking everyone to make sure that you do your due diligence, um, talk about some of the protections that we, we mentioned here and ways that you can check on things. And again, be sure to call our office and we're happy to maybe point out some red flags or if something is, is serious, you know, we can get involved and potentially do enforcement. So if someone is interested, do they call you and what do you advise them? How do you advise them? Uh, we can't provide investment advice, right. we can't recommend uh, one investment over another, right. but people often call and, and say, I was approached about this investment, uh, is it registered, is it something you know uh, that would be smart to invest in? And again, we can't say whether or not it's a good idea, but we can, we can maybe point out some of the things in a prospectus you know, oh, they're just, there's a 17% fee on the front of this, or, you know, your money is locked up for a five-year period. Are you, you know, you have to think about these kinds of things. And so if you do want to get more specific advice, we also recommend um, turning to a trusted uh, advisor for those types of things. And certainly with advisor. the marijuana issue, the control board comes into play. Exactly. Right, you would want to make sure, just like with any business, say if you were investing in a restaurant, you would want to make sure if it's a local business that they have a business license, that they have a business plan, that there they have all these sorts of things. And just like that, if a marijuana business approached you as a potential investor, you'd want to make sure that they have all of those pieces in place. And because it's more regulated, there are other hoops that they're going to have to jump through with other regulatory agencies that they're going to need to make sure um, are in place. Very briefly, what's a pump and dump? Oh, you want to talk about Sure. So uh, <laughs> a pump and dump scam, and that's what, what we worry about with these new hot new things, is where um, someone will dial for dollars. A, a company that owns a lot of the stock will um, call investors, raise the rates or raise the, the price, and then they'll sell it when it's high and then it becomes worthless. So you pump it up and then you dump, dump it. it. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with our guests, Christy Naylor and David Newman, right after this. The Investor Protection Trust is devoted to investor education. Learn more about the basics of saving and investing, investor education resources for military families, and elder fraud prevention resources. Visit InvestorProtection.org. We're back with Christy Naylor and David Newman, who are with the Division of Banking and Securities. So I have a question. What type of questions should someone ask their, themselves before they're, to, just to see if they're ready to invest? So probably the most important question would be, do I have the money to invest? And you have to think about whether you have the money and you're willing to have it be potentially tied up for a significant period of time, and if you could bear a risk of losing um, some or all of that money. Mm -hmm. uh, you also want to think about your investment goals. Are you trying to save money for something in the short term or in the long term? Also, uh, is the investment a right for me? Is it something that maybe fits in, in what I'm thinking about doing? And if it meets your risk tolerance levels, I think, are you do you consider yourself to be more risky, more risk averse? Those are things to think about. 
also has the seller or you know the issuer of these securities given me some sort of written materials for me to consider like a prospectus you should always expect to receive written materials if you're um, thinking about an investment and then finally um, is the seller registered uh, to do business in Alaska very good and actually read the prospectus read the prospectus <laughs> yes that's where you see that 17 percent uh, you know, fee that we talked about. And if there's any questions, they can all, always yes. contact your office. Yes. They are long, but it's worth it in the end to, to go is. through them carefully, that's mm -hmm. for sure. What is the smartest way to check out a broker dealer? And we have a little slide up as a prompt. Well, there's a few ways. Obviously, we've been saying that you can contact us directly and we can look up people um, through our own system. There also is something called FINRA's Broker Check which you can check on a broker dealer or an investment advisor that you might be interested in investing with. You might have met somebody and you're not sure. You want to make sure they don't have any disciplinary action against them. You want to make sure they're properly registered in your state. You can go on Finner's Broker Check and um, type in the company name or the individual's name and they will give you a detailed listing of uh, their background and I think that's extremely helpful. The Securities and Exchange Commission on sec.gov also has what's called IAPD, which is the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure. So you can check on an investment advisor there as well. Um, so I s would say those are probably the three main things. Contact us directly or FINRA's Broker Check or uh, the SEC's IAPD. Now what type of information, if I were to check out some I'm considering, um, if there were a disciplinary action, would it go into detail as far as what happened, the background of what happened? It does because the disciplinary information is typically put in by the regulator. So if we take an action against a licensee, then we enter in the narrative information about what happened and that's what goes into broker check. Does FINRA and the SEC, do they talk to each other on this? these two? systems? Yes, if you're if you're working with an advisor and you're not sure if they're an investment advisor or a broker dealer, it's a great idea just to go into broker check and it will direct you to the IAPD if they're an investment advisor um, or you'll stay in broker check if they're IAPD. a broker. Investment advisor or public disclosure. Very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to step back, step, take one more step back. Um, describe if you would the difference between an investment advisor and a broker dealer. What for those who may not be familiar with the investment world and who want to get into it, how do you distinguish between the two? Well, I would say the most important thing between, at this moment, between a broker dealer and an investment advisor um, is a broker dealer, the person working for them is called an agent, and they're basically selling the funds that the broker dealer offers. And that person, which differs from an investment advisor, at this time doesn't owe a fiduciary um, duty to their client which basically means if there's similar type products and one of them has a higher commission rate that the agent would have, it's okay for the agent to go ahead and pick the higher commission rate for themselves. It's really basically saying you're not looking out for the best interest of the person you're buying the product for. Mm. Though the investments do always have to be suitable. Yes. Right. That is No correct. matter who you're working for. Investment advisor is a little different because basically they take a percentage of uh, the total assets they have under management. So if I have um, $100,000 with them, they, and their percentage that they take from me is 1%, the, the fees that I would be paying every year is $1,000. But it's interesting to note because that's good because it encourages them to do a better job for you. Because the better job they do for you, the more money you get um, at the end. So it kind of depends on your horizon. Yes. And what your personal goals are, mm -hmm. all kinds of factors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've got this next slide up, 10 questions to ask a financial advisor you're thinking of hiring. Right. And the first one is, what experience do you have? So I would say stop number one should always be our office or broker check or our IPD, but you want to ask them, interview them, tell me about your experience, how long have you been doing this, what's your background, because uh, a lot of people don't know, you don't have to have a degree in finance or business or accounting, anything like that in order to be an investment advisor or a broker dealer. Um, often we see that the backgrounds that these people have is in sales. Mm -hmm. So uh, you want to make sure that you're working with someone that has at least some understanding or, or experience doing this. 
And same, that goes into what are your qualifications? You want to know about their qualifications in order to why, you know, what makes them, uh, you know, a good uh, financial advisor. And there's some people who have certain acronyms after their name. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ones typically to look out for um, are either a CFA, which is a Chartered Financial Analyst, or a CFP, which is a Certified Financial Planner. Um, those people will have more of an education, more preparation before going into the business than some people, other people. Those are very different, very difficult things to achieve. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done. There's exams that have to be passed. Right. So that there's there's other ones as well, but those are probably the two most uh, noticeable ones that are out there that you probably would see the most. So it's something for people to look out for. And we have seen people make up. Uh, acronyms mm -hmm. that don't really mean anything. So if you know, it's there's so many that are recognized. I would say it's probably in the area of about 25 to 30 that are recognized. That you know, if you make one up, then y people might not necessarily know. And it sounds really good, um, but <laughs> yes. it, okay. it uh, yeah, isn't necessarily. So make sure you check on that. All right. And the third point: What services do you offer? Right. Some uh, advisors also sell insurance. Um, some advisors also do um, financial planning, which involves more than just your investments. So if you're interested in those types of services, you may want to see a financial planner um, versus a, some other type. I like this fourth one. What is your approach to financial planning? Hmm. And I think that you can learn a lot about uh, a planner or advisor by asking that question. That's a question that we actually ask when we go on mm -hmm. our audits, when we go on our exams. Um, tell us what, you know, what's your theory, how do you, what do you think about investing? And they should be pretty knowledgeable and be able to give you a succinct answer. And the fifth one I didn't even think about until I saw this, will you be the only person working with me? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yes, yeah. The sixth one, will, how will I pay for your services? This is a very important question yes. and you should always ask how do you get paid? Um, no, none of these financial professionals are doing this for free. No. <laughs> sure. And the seventh, how, how much do you typically charge? And we actually have a little chart here that mm -hmm. uh, is wonderful. It's um, actually a chart that you put together and it shows, I'm going to switch screens here and go to, there it is, it's the fees, portfolio value from investing $100,000 over 20 years. Tell me about this chart. Well, this is a release actually from the SEC that they put together, and we use this in our outreach to demonstrate really um, the value of compounding interest and also the what fees can cost you over time. And it shows that if you have the same $100,000 starting in 2013 and everybody is getting a 4% return, how a different fee will cost you money over uh, a 20 year period of time. And if the difference between 1% and 0.25% is $30,000 in that time period. And it really, when 0 0.5, 0 0.25 and 1.0 doesn't sound like much. No. That's the critical point here. Right. But when over time, that's real dollars. Exactly. And so when you think about that, in some we do see some charging 2%. What's the difference between 2% and 0.25? You know, it's, it, it's astounding, the amount of money. Big dollars. Mm -hmm. And then continuing on, continuing on, number eight, could anyone besides me benefit from your recommendations? Right, I think it's um, to, important to talk about conflicts of interest. Like David mentioned, some advisors have a fiduciary duty, so they do need to disclose those. Uh, if they sell insurance as well, they may get a commission from the insurance side. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure that um, those are disclosed, not necessarily bad things, you just need to know about them. And I would say it's very important to specifically ask um, your agent or your representative what their fees are and have them show them to you. Because it is, they, the industry sometimes has a way of hiding the fees so you're not able to really read them and understand them. There are some prospectuses where they'll have the listing for the fees on the 72nd page and it'll actually be a link to a website um, and then once you click on the website, you'll have five different choices. And it's very confusing and it's very difficult to find out what actually you are paying. So it's extremely important uh, when you talk to an agent or a representative to find out what their fees are and get it in writing so you have it. And let them walk you through and explain it to you because that'll really have you understand, you know, what this is costing me, how much money they're actually making, and what 
type of consequence th that that can have, like on this chart, mm -hmm. over the long period of time. And people need to sit down and figure that out. Mm -hmm. The ninth ha asked the question, have you ever been disciplined? And that's, that's the information that can be s found in FINRA. Yes, um, but they should disclose that to you if you ask that question. Uh, if you work with an investment advisor, they have something that's called a form ADV, and that's just a form that has all of this information that we just covered, and they have to write it in a, a reasonably understandable way to cover all these questions, and they have to give that to you when you um, become a client. So you should ask, if you are working with an investment advisor, may I see your ADV? They, they should uh, give it to you without mm -hmm. you having to ask, but um, Make sure that you look at that and read in detail because it does have disciplinary history in there as well. And finally, the tenth one, can I get this in writing? Mm -hmm. Very Always. important. Always. Very important. <laughs> Wanted to uh, put up your contact information here. And again, if people are thinking of investing, if they're thinking of an inv a particular investment, if they're thinking of contacting an advisor, mm -hmm. under what other circumstances should people call you? Anything. I mean, if they get a strange email that's asking them for money, if they get a strange phone call that they're, they're not sure, um, any, I mean, it, it runs the whole gamut of uh, ways that people can be contacted or if they're just somebody recommends something. I mean, a lot of things we see are uh, friends recommending things to other friends or family members recommending stuff to family members. If that happens and you're not really sure and you just want to make sure everything's on the up and up, everything looks right, Give us a call. I mean, we're there for the people. Our, our number one thing at the Division of Banking and Securities is to protect the public. So we are there for Alaska residents. So if anybody has any questions ever, feel free to pick up the phone and give us a call. It's not just Christy and Ivy. There's other examiners in the office, um, investigators in the office that they can talk to, and we're always willing to talk to people. Fantastic. I want to thank our guests, Christy Naylor and David Newman of the Alaska Division of Banking and Securities. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization with more than 87,000 members in Alaska. AARP is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for all as we age. We lead positive social change and deliver value to our members through information, advocacy, and service. Thank you for watching AARP Alaska. Funding for this program made possible by the Investor Protection Trust, the State of Alaska Division of Banking and Securities, and AARP Alaska.